He was playing piano by age five, made his first public appearance at the ripe old age of seven, and by the time he had turned 18, he was an award-winning virtuoso. Over 30 albums later, he's still going strong, with concerts, symphony appearances, and his work on such hit movies as Atonement and Pride and Prejudice. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with award-winning pianist Jean-Yves Thiboudet. What is it you hear? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, we are so concentrated when we play. I think most people ask me usually, what do you see? What do you think? Do you hear anything else in the music? And usually, I don't. I'm so concentrated that I don't even hear a cell phone ringing sometimes. I don't hear anything going on. I'm just so much in my music. So I just hear the piano. I just hear the music that I'm playing. I'm just completely in it and nothing else. It's like the world has completely shut down. You feel the audience because you know you feel their presence, but you don't really hear them though. It's all very, very strange. Are you aware of the piece as a technical thing you're doing, or is it just a place where you go with the music? No, I think by the time when I'm just performing, I don't think about the technical things anymore. I really just leave the piece. It's just really, it's like it's like something that you're passionate about. You just leave it completely through the piece and sometimes you don't remember what happened and then it's <laughs> finished, the concert is finished and sometimes you think you didn't do something so well and people will tell you oh, it was wonderful. Then you listen to a tape and it was really good and sometimes the other way around, I think I did so well and then I listened to the tape and I said, well, it was not that good. Yeah. So I think you don't have the real perception of what you're doing. You're so concentrated in what you do that you just lose really perception of the rest of the world. When you started all of this, you were three years old? Not quite that young. <laughs> uh, I started, five, uh, five years old I had my first lesson, my first piano lesson, officially. But from what my parents told me, I was going to the piano when I was three or three and a half. We had a piano in the living room, and it was my favorite toy, apparently. I was just attracted to it like a magnet. I would close the door of the living room and just sit at the piano, just stay there for hours. And you know how sometimes kids usually, they just bang the piano. And I was not doing that, I was just playing very softly and trying to find nice chords together and singing along. And my parents said, you know, it probably is some kind of gift there. Maybe we'll start him with the piano. <clears throat> and that's what they did. Did you ever have to learn, per se, what was where, or was it instinctual for you? No, of course. I mean, you always have to learn. What is funny with me is that I learned to read the notes before I learned to read alphabet. So I could read music before I could actually read you know, normal text. That's because I started very, very early. Okay. But, uh, no, you still have to learn everything. I mean, it's not that I learned every note, and, but it, it, I was so young, and at that age, you learn so quickly that it was very instinctive. You know, at the end, it's the same. Yeah. What is your favorite piece to play? That's impossible. It's like if you ask somebody, what is your favorite food? Or what, there's so many things that I like to play, and for different reasons, and also at different time of the day, of my life, of the month. It's just impossible. I would say probably... Periods. I can, I can say periods of music. I think the romantic period right now is my favorite period, the large romantic period. So that would be Chopin, Liszt, Brahms, Schumann, Rachmaninoff, all that huge, marvelous period of music. Uh, and the French Impressionist, uh, Bravel, Debussy, Fauré, Satie, all that period. Those might be right now my two favorite periods. I don't play so much of the real classical right now, Mozart, Beethoven, a bit of Beethoven concertos, Mendelssohn, but... This is, you know, and it changes, and, and I just love, there's so many things I love. It's impossible to pinpoint and say, this is my favorite piece. I could not say that. As a child, when you were playing, was it classical music that spoke to you? Was it just the ability to create music, to play it? What was it that drew you in? You know, I think when you're a child, you don't know what the difference is between classical, jazz, whatever. You just, music is music. So I was raised with classical, definitely. Uh, my parents were great classic music lover. Um, we didn't, I think I didn't even hear jazz until I was 14 or 15, much later, when I started going to the conservatory in Paris. So it's something I discovered later in my life. 
But if I had, I probably wouldn't have made the difference. It was just music. Either I would like it or not like it. But I think I was really raised with classical. I think that's probably a fact. And mostly uh, instrumental, symphonic, not even so much opera. Opera and voice is also something that came late in my life, funny enough. So it was mostly the symphonic and, and the piano and the violin and all of them. Popular music? Ever yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, no, of course. Popular music was very, you know, very big. In France, we have a lot of marvel marvelous yeah. singers. And my sister, who is very close to me, she is only 18 months older. And of course, she had, she was, you know, fan about all this marvelous, young, good-looking singers in France. And we had the posters in her bedroom. And so I, I was part of all of that. We had, you know, the little single, the 45, and the little singles and all of that. So that was part, of course, of me growing up, of course. See, it's always a part I wonder about when I talk to somebody that does what you do or in your, your world is there must be that point where there's, you're torn between what is popular, what your contemporaries, your friends are into, and yet you're doing this other world and you're making that so important. It's true, but uh, yeah, I didn't see it. It was not a battle for me. I mean, it was two completely different things. I mean, classical was my world. It was my passion. It was what I was doing. Uh, my friends knew that. Uh, of course, those popular singers were you know, very famous in France and we were listening to them, but I was not attracted to them. It was not something I wanted to do. I liked to listen to them, but I was very comfortable from a really early age with what I was doing. That was my kind of music for me. It was the normal, you know, if they said anything like that, the normal kind of music. And even though with my friends, it's true that sometimes it was difficult. Well, there was those that were with me at the conservatory, then they were going through the same academic right. cycles. That was fine. But the others, sometimes it's true, I mean, all my friends would, after school would say, oh, now let's go and play football in the garden or something. And I would have to go home and practice my piano. But that was part of my life. And, and it was never uh, something that I didn't enjoy. I was actually looking forward to it. My parents didn't have to like lock me in the room to practice or anything. <laughs> I was never pushed in anything. It was always something I was enjoying, always enjoying. I was never forced to do anything. It was very natural. I've heard that you said that you've always had good teachers. It was never one of those had, smack your hands with no, the ruler and all that God, stuff. No, thank God, no. I had marvelous teachers. And I think that's so important. It's so important to have the right person, the right human being that makes you love and what you do and to learn more. And for me, it was fantastic. From the first one, all of them at their own time were absolutely perfect. And I just loved them dearly. They were like, some of them, the older ladies were like grandmothers. And I was looking forward so much to my lessons always. They were so kind. And at the same time, I was respecting them. And I was just a little bit afraid, just what you need to be afraid, just to be prepared for the lesson, you know, just enough of that. But the rest of the time, they were so wonderful to me. I was really lucky. Where did the confidence come from in your playing? I think I always say that if you start performing in public very early, I think it does help. It will never be... Uh, completely natural to play in front of 4,000 people. I don't think anybody <laughs> can say that. Uh, we get used to it. That's the only difference. And I think if you start very early, you have more chances than if you start much later in your life. It's always difficult. It's not the world, but it's a challenge. You know, every concert is, you just learn how to live with it. And some nights you're more nervous. It's just not even the word nervous, but it, there's just all that adrenaline, all that tension, all that... Uh, pressure you feel and that's always there so you just learn to live with it and you don't think about it and you're fine and, and one night in a while you know you feel a little bit more and you just have to overcome it all the time when you were younger did you ever question it did you ever think to yourself am i really that good do i really deserve this attention do i really res and there was a point where you just started winning competition after competition yeah i think it was again i was very lucky i think it was a very natural process i was never pushed too fast which i think is very important you don't want to push a child too much. And it's nothing worse in a way that if you win something very, very young and suddenly the world opens its door and you have 200 concerts a year and you're everywhere. And that's, I think, it's impossible to, to live with. Thank God it never happened to me. It all came gradually at its time. I was like going up on the ladder, you know, one by one, one step by one step. And I think that's terribly important. So I, I always felt comfortable with myself, comfortable in my shoes and looking forward to the next step that I, w I would go to. And I think that was a blessing, really. Does there come a point where the awards just don't matter anymore? I mean, you've won so many. Well, they always do. You know, of course, uh, I can remember my first, my first ever 
award in France, which was very cute. I was 11. It was called <laughs> the Royaume de la Musique, the Kingdom of Music. And it was two wonderful ladies. They were absolutely, you know, they devoted their life to music and young talents. And they would go all around France and do regional finals and semifinals and whatever. And then at the end, each regional would go to Paris. And then it was a big final in Paris. And then when you were winning, they won in Paris, the prize was to play with an orchestra, which of course I'd never done in my life. I was 11. So that's what I did. I won that and I was in Paris in front of that orchestra and it was live on TV, which I'd never done either. <laughs> and I played a concerto. And the funny thing is that at that age, I think you don't realize. You're not even nervous. You just don't even know what you're doing. You're just there, you play, you sit down, you look at people, you laugh. You just don't even know what's going on. And the TV, even less, you know. Yeah. It's really, that's the funny thing. And then it's just as it comes with life, you realize more of the reality. But it was fun. So I remember that. And the awards are always something that touches you and that means a lot to you that something is recognized, recognition, whatever is coming from, is always very touching. So I cannot say that, you know, you never will, I think you can never get used to them. It's like, oh, another award. No, I think you always touch and it's always something very special. And it's also very moving. And it's funny even that you've got a few awards and you've got a few ceremonies and then the day when you get a special one, it's still an incredible moving experience. I remember when uh, a couple of years ago, the... French government gave me the what they call Arts et Lettres, Chevalier des Arts et Lettres, and it was a big reception at the French Embassy in Washington. And I had to make a speech, and I made a speech. I did it in French and English because I thought it would be proper. And my mother was there, and some really close friends, and all of that. And I remember starting the speech, and I was losing my voice. I could not. I was so tempted and so moved, you know, yeah. that it just closed down completely. And I thought that would never happen. <laughs> I, I, I spoke so many times and. And then I realized that I was still, still, every time it can, you know, it, it's a real, it's something touching for you. Yeah. Of course. How far along in your success did your father get to see for you? Unfortunately, not, you know, long enough. I, I, now he could have left even earlier because he was a rather old gentleman to have a young kid. Uh, my father was almost 60 when I was born, oh, wow. which is amazing. So it was really like a second life for him. My, my mother was his second wife. Uh, so he, I was uh, 19 when he died. And of course, I think, you know, we had 19 wonderful years. But I, I, f I feel in a way, especially with that huge age difference, that this is just about the time when I was starting to understand him and to get closer to him and to appreciate him and to ask him questions. I mean, he had a fantastic life, so many things. And I feel it's just sad that this is the moment, you know, he had to go. But he still had a lot of, he was very, I think he was very proud of me. And actually, one of the last things that happened is when I won this competition in Tokyo, in Japan. That was the 2nd of December, and my father died on the 5th of December. I was still in Japan, and I remember calling him, and he was so excited. And the last thing he did the day after was writing articles for the newspapers in Lyon, which is my hometown, and bringing them himself to all the newspapers to make sure <laughs> they would put in the next, you know, the next day paper, which they did. And then the next morning, he just had a heart attack and just went. So I think he had some nice excitement yeah. all the way to the end. And he was really proud of me. What is it that you bring to the piano, do you think, that has given you all of this success? There are so many people who play a piano, and a piano <laughs> is an object that sits in That's the room. Right. But what is it that you do unique there? You know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's not asking the person is difficult. You should ask people that come to my concert, the people in the business. I don't know. Uh, I think we're all incredibly different. As you say, a piano is a piano. It's got 88 keys, three pedal, is black and white, and they're all the same. And yet, when a pianist plays and another pianist and another pianist, it sounds different. And they bring a different life and they bring a completely different emotion. So I think it's something that is completely personal. I think it takes a lot of different ingredients. Obviously, the technique, which is important, but this, by working, working hard, you probably can over, overcome that. Um, and then I think I really think that at the end of the day the most important thing is your personality it's the charisma is the the communication the, the gift of communication that you have with people and I think some people have it and some just don't have it and this is not something you can learn I think you're born with it and you feel that when you go to concert I go a lot to concerts too and you feel when a performer arrives 
on stage, and sometime before they have even started doing whatever they do, singing or playing, you're already excited. I mean, you just feel that incredible electricity yeah. almost. It's like a magnetism, and, and that's the charisma. And some have it, and some just don't have it. When you listen to your works back, easy for you to do or no? No, I hardly ever listen. Why? Uh, I've done a lot of recordings, and they send me the recording, the first one, to make sure that I prove it before they press it. Once it's done, I li listen, I said, okay, it's fine. And I'm usually, at that moment, I'm usually quite happy because this is the best <laughs> I did at that moment, right. at least. And then I put it in, in the box and they close it somewhere, and then I usually never listen to them again. It's very rare that I listen to my records. I'm not interested, because, also because you change. A record, in a way, is a, record is a given moment in time, at this precise moment, at 5.34 p.m. on Monday the 18th, this is how I play this piece. Right. Now, the next day, the next week, the next year... I'll play it differently. I don't say it's better, but I've lived a year more, and, and you are different. And I'm usually not perfectly happy when I, I said, yeah, it's all right, but I always want to change and do it differently or do it better because we always try to do better. So it's not interesting for an artist to listen to his own work. I, I really, it's not something I'm looking forward to do. <laughs> yeah. How about when you started playing jazz, professionally, I should say? Yeah, as professional as it is, because I'm really not <laughs> as professional as you think. I think it's an illusion. I just love jazz. I adore jazz. It gives me so much pleasure, and it's so important in my life uh, as a musician that I wanted to play some. And I did learn about it, and I'm still learning, because it's a very long process. I will never be a great jazz player, and I'm very honest about it. And I Why think do that's you say the most that? Simple. Just because I was not raised like that. I mean, it would take me years. If I, I might get better, but it would take me another 10 years or 20 years before I could really be at the level where I would like to be if I wanted to be taken seriously as a jazz pianist. Just because it's a completely different way to, to work. I mean, the improvisation is obviously the main problem. Not only have, you just have to learn all the harmonies and all the tricks and all the whatever, all the things that they are, but it's just that way of thinking which is completely different in your brain than what you do i think it's like switching your brain completely we just raised to have a score in front of us learn the score make the score perfect then memorize it, and then play it and this is where you have to forget it this is there's no score there's nothing to memorize nothing to do you just create it's like being in, in with a, a blank completely white canvas and you have to make a painting this is difficult as far as completely different. So I, I started working on that, and it was a terrific experience. I've learned a lot from it, but I'm far from being anywhere where I'd like to be. So I always tell people I'm very frank about it and very direct. I always say I'm a classical musician. I love jazz. And this is jazz how I <clears throat> interpret it with my personality and my uh, education. And of course, it is different than a jazz player. But I think it's interesting, and I thought that was... My point was to say this is how I play Belevens, and it's my tribute to Belevens or Duke Ellington because I admire them. But I will not, and actually I refuse. I've been invited by quite a few jazz festivals, and a straight jazz concert, I just refuse to do it because I know my limits. I know I can't deliver what they're waiting for me. So I will do it in a different format, which I think is interesting. I will do it half, you know, half classical, half jazz, basically showing the link between jazz and classical and showing how they all influence each other, especially Debussy, Ravel, Satie, uh, Gershwin, Bill Evans, which, because I was in that uh, record of Bill Evans. And then that's interesting. Then I speak to the audience, I play some Debussy, I play some Satie, then I play some Bill Evans. Then they see the similarities. They see how this music is connected. And this is where I feel I can say something different than some others. But I will not just play jazz for an hour with a trio or an orchestra. I just cannot do it. Any backlash from the classical community? No, actually, I think because I was very honest, uh, I was actually worried to be beaten up from both sides because I was going to think, you know, <laughs> yeah. the jazz people said, who does he think he is, you know, play jazz, and the classic said, what is he doing? And I have to say, since I made the message very clear that it was just for me a tribute to the jazz world as a classical musician, they both really appreciated it, and I think it was very well received in both communities which made me very proud, and that's why we did a second album after the Beloveds with Duke Ellington. And I hope maybe in the future I'll do another project. But I have to say, people really understood the, my message, really. It was very good. Does your life change with the fame and success? It probably does. I cannot say it doesn't. You don't think about it when you wake up in the morning. And also, our 
fame and success has nothing to do with like Madonna's fame and success. You know, we can still go in the street, go in the shops, and people are not going to run and scream after you, which I think is fantastic. But that really must be very, very hard. So we have our fame and success in our world. Uh, in some countries, especially I'm thinking of Asia or some place like that, you can have actually a fame that is beyond usual classical. We can have almost like a rock star kind of fame which is fun for five minutes, you know, when you're in Asia, it's fine. But living like that all year around, I think, would be very difficult. So I, I, think, I think it's actually very touching. I, I will go to a concert of some colleagues, whatever, and, and somebody in the audience will just come up and ask me for an autograph. And I said, oh, well, it's like, oh, good, they recognize me. It's, <laughs> it's kind of sweet and, and nice. So I think we all enjoy that. But I don't think we have too much problem with our everyday life with that, thank God. Because, again, I don't think it's a blessing. It must be very difficult to deal with. Does it surprise you, though, the interest in who you are as opposed to just the music you play? Yes, I think, and I'm always saying this is because we're in 2008 and this has changed tremendously. I think probably 40 years ago, 50 years ago, people were actually happy enough with just going to a concert, listening to Rubinstein and going home, eventually have his record, but that was about it. But now things have changed completely because of the internet, because of the, all the medias, all the television, all the magazines. I mean, there's so much out there for people that people actually want to know the human being behind the pianist or the singer. It's just not enough to hear the concert. And I think you have to play that game. And it's part of the package of having a career. I think some people have a real hard time with it. And I respect it. And it must be difficult. But I think, unfortunately, you have to go through that. And I think you have to accept it, that... People just want to know. They want to know what you like, what you do. They mm -hmm. want to hear your voice. They want to hear you speak. Uh, I always, for example, speak at the end of my concert to announce the uh, encores. And I think that's important. Just the fact that you speak to people, they hear your voice, they suddenly feel closer to you. And I think it's important. That, that old image of the artist that was like, you know, couldn't touch, was like an idol on, on the Right. pedestal on the stage, and then it would disappear and go home. No, people like to meet you, to have you, you sign your CDs and take pictures with you. And, and I find it very, very nice. I mean, I'm very comfortable with that. How is it different between, I understand you live both in Paris and in L.A.? At Los Angeles is actually my primary residence, and I've been resident in the United States for many years now, and I'm really proud of it, and I feel very comfortable, and I do spend more than half of the year in this country playing everywhere, and, and really... I'm very comfortable with it. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. But I'm very comfortable. And I've been from the first day I came to this country. This being said, of course, all Europe has something that is very special and certain things that you don't have here and vice versa over there that I miss things that I have here. So I feel in a way that it's a very rich and very privileged life to be able to have both. Uh, and I think, again, they're very complementary and very different. What I have in Paris is things that I don't have in Los Angeles and, and I'm really happy with that. Now, musically, I think the first thing that would come to my mind is, unfortunately, the age of the uh, audience. In Europe, in France in particular, we have really a problem with young people going to concert. I think more than in the States or even UK. UK has always been a bit of an exception for that. But I see in France, in Germany, in, in Austria, and all those kind of traditional places where you would think that music has been there forever. Well, it has. But unfortunately... You see the subscribers to the concert are quite old. It's really older people. And I think we're working very hard on that. But that's probably musically the first thing that would come to my mind. I see much more of a young generation coming to concert in the States, universities. And I don't know, I just see a lot of young people in the concert that I don't see so much in, in Europe. That's funny. If I had to pick, I would have said it was the you other way around. Yeah. I really don't think so. Huh. I'm fascinated to see in this country how, how many young I mean, teenagers, at least you know, 18, 20 people that come to the concerts. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it has to be because we have, I think, a good system of education, for example, for music and all of that. I just don't know what it is. I think, you know what, I think it's the image of classical music. I think the image of classical music everywhere in the world is very dusty, very old, very traditional, and even more, I think, in Europe. And that's what is against us. I think we need to send a message out there to those kids to say, listen, classical music is cool, it's fun, you're going to enjoy it, you're going to like it. And that's what we need to do. And I feel in this country, it is considered maybe a little bit more, maybe. Besides sending out the message, what do you do, parents are watching, what do they do to get them excited about classical music? You know, it's, it's difficult. I wish there was a little secret that we could just, just give. I think 
first of all, you need to give an experience to the child. First of all, give them a chance to have a, listen to a concert, for example, or go to rehearsal, uh, buy them a record, watch TV, a program, whatever it is. But I think they have to have that first opportunity. And most of the time, actually, they actually really enjoy it. They find it very peaceful. That's a word that I hear always from kids after one of their first experience of classical music, they will come and we say, how do you like it? I said, oh, it was really peaceful because it's relaxing for them. <laughs> they used to have this music right. that goes, you know, mad. So this for them is really something very relaxing and I, and I like that. Uh, so that's the first thing, is to give them the opportunity to have some, you know, to come close to that music. And after that, I think it's really to the performers almost, to most of us, especially the young, youngish kind of, you know, artists, uh, to just show them that we're normal people, that we like the same thing they like, so they can relate to us a little bit more, instead of thinking that we're a completely different breed that they will never understand. Also, that classical music is something you can enjoy, even if you haven't learned it, even if you have studied. They're always afraid that they will not understand it. Yeah. And it's not. You just listen, you open your ears, and you just enjoy it. You don't have to have... That's another important thing. But really, most frankly, I think, is just the image thing. We just show them that we're normal people. We like to go out dancing, go to the bar. I mean, we just wear clothes like they do, <laughs> jeans and sneakers. And, I mean, they're just sometimes shocked that they say, oh, you don't really look like a classical pianist. So what am I supposed to look like, you know? <laughs> I mean, this is really funny. So I think that's the point. But well, we're happy you look like you do and you wear what you do <laughs> and you do the work you do. Thank you so much for taking the time Thank to you. talk to us. Thank you. pleasure. Jean-Yves Thiboudet. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.